Hey guys, this is gonna be an educational video on the topic of how to spot very complicated tactics. So the target audience for this is probably a little bit higher rated than a lot of my typical videos. Maybe if you're above 1500, you might get the most out of this. If you're below that, it might still help you, kind of give you some insight into what stronger players are thinking about. So regardless, I think you'll probably learn a thing or two. We're gonna be focusing primarily on this position right here, but I am gonna show you the entire game leading up to this point so you can understand how we arrived here. Um, so let's go ahead and jump back to the beginning and we'll get started. All right, so here we go. I was playing as white against a strong national master, played the Carol Con, and I played the line that I teach in my E4 Gambit course, and it's this Bishop C4 line. It's a, basically the point is we're gonna immediately put pressure on this pawn, on this diagonal, and then follow it up with F3 and, and give up this pawn to get the uh, F file open, and it leads to some very nice attacking positions. So I like to play this one. I talk a lot about it in my course, and I did play F3. Now, uh, my opponent accepted it. They don't have to accept it. Sometimes people will decline it with uh, E3, which is kind of boring in my opinion, but a lot of people do accept it. I captured. There's a couple of moves that black could play here. Bishop G4 is a blunder that actually happens quite a bit. It's a very standard move in the Karo Khan, but it's bad. And if you would like to pause, how do you think I can take advantage of this? Well, if you had a chance to look at that, there's two ways to do it, but Bishop takes F7 check is very simple. And when the king recaptures, the knight comes in with check, unleashes my queen, and I'm getting my piece back. Um, and I'm also, you know, the black king now has no castling rights. Uh, it's, it's kind of open because it's missing the F pawn. And this is a great position for me. The other way to play it, which is also good for me, is to play knight to E5 right away. And if black tries to take my queen, they get checkmated. And so the only move for black, well, they can go to H5 to defend this way. But then again, I sacrifice the queen which also leads to checkmate. And so the only thing they can play at this point would be bishop to e6. But once I trade this, this is a terrible bishop now for black because of these double isolated pawns, a great position for me. So however you want to look at it, bishop g4 is a big mistake. The main move here is bishop to f5. And then the other line, which sometimes people will play is e6. Very passive. Uh, they're choosing to leave the bishop stuck back here behind the pawn chain. It's, uh, it doesn't become a target, like sometimes, as we saw, it, that bishop became a target, and so that's the benefit of this. The downside is you have a bad bishop that's kind of passive for most of the game. So anyway, I castled, developed my bishop, and I played queen to e1. Now, this is a very common maneuver when you are thinking about attacking on the king side, and your queen doesn't have a direct uh, route over there because the knight's blocking it. A lot of times what you can do is play queen to e1, and it gives you two different options now to bring the queen over and attack on the king side. And so that's kind of what I was doing. You might say that looks weird stepping into a pin. I'm not really worried about this right now. I'm planning on moving the queen pretty soon anyway. I just need to get it over there. So that's the idea. My opponent captured that knight and played h6. And so I went ahead and followed up with the plan of queen to h4. It also creates a pin on the rook so that my bishop is tactically defended here. If black tries to take this. They will lose the rook, okay? Now, a lot of people will castle here, but if this happened, I was absolutely planning on sacrificing my bishop and opening up the king. And the nice thing here is that now I can drop this bishop back in the future and create a checkmate threat. And it's very difficult for black to stop that. Yes, it's defended by the knight, but for example, um, well, let's just say, I don't know what they're gonna play. Let's say they bring the queen out and I drop this bishop back. Black has to be extremely careful that I don't bring my knight in and then get rid of these knights and get checkmate. Okay, so for example, black waste to move, I play knight to e5, and the problem for black is that both of these guys are under attack, and that's the only thing stopping the checkmate. So for example, I'm gonna simply take here, if the knight recaptures, I have checkmate. Um, um, yeah, like this is checkmate. Or if, well, there's not really another good move for black, because if this, then the knight is also getting captured. However you look at it, it's not good. So that's kind of the idea. That's just the point. Um, now, of course, black can play better moves, but I'm just letting you guys know I was planning on sacrificing it. So my opponent, I think, was aware of that and didn't want to castle kingside. All right. And so he played queen to a5. I dropped my bishop back anyway because it wasn't really doing too much here, and I wanted to be ready in case black did decide to castle. Also, this way it's defended. I don't have to worry about any tactics where my bishop is, is loose and maybe gets attacked by some of these moves. I don't know. And so bishop d3 brought the rook over to the center. I'm not really worried about these pawns because I'm trying to launch an attack on the king. Like if black wants to get greedy and start taking some pawns, that's fine with me. I'm going to keep attacking. 
and usually that's not going to end well for black. If you leave your king in the center for too long, when all the pieces start getting involved and attacking, there's usually some some sort of good combination, right? So bishop to b7, I brought my knight into e5, and my opponent here castles uh, queenside. I think they missed this idea, um, probably because here's I think this is what I think they were thinking. If I go for the fork now, they actually have h takes g5, which attacks my queen. And once I retreat the queen, yes, I'm able to get a rook. Um, that's Black's turn. Um, I'm able to get a rook, but they get two pieces. So they have the two knights for the rook, which actually is a pretty nice trade for Black. So I think that's what they were thinking. However, rather than going for it right away, I can throw in this capture, which is what I played. And now Black doesn't have this move of capturing me anymore, okay? And so now I can go and I actually get a fork. So I'm doing really well here. They capture the pawn, I decided to take the rook. I wanted to take this rook because when they take me back, I felt like the rook was kind of out of place over there, as opposed to if I take this way and they take back, well now the rook is right where you might want it to be, attacking my pawn. So little detail there, but I think it was important and it kind of buys me an extra move, right? Okay. Rook takes e6, it was a free pawn, and at this moment in the game, I was starting to think about a tactic. Now, I don't want to give it away just yet, so I'm not going to tell you any more than that, except I was starting to think about something here, okay? So rook to d8, and again, I'm thinking about a particular tactic, um, and that's when I played rook to e7. And then when my opponent captured here, it worked out very nicely, they walked right into what I was setting up. So if you would like to pause and try to think through here, what do you think uh, a good move for white would be? All right, well, if you had a chance to look at that, I'm gonna tell you what I played. I'm gonna walk you through how I arrived at this conclusion, why it's a good tactic. And then we're gonna talk about something else in the position that I actually totally missed that was an even better move, okay? So the move that I played here was queen to h3 check. And at first glance, it kind of looks like, oh, I'm just saving my queen. Actually, I'm not. I mean, I mean, yes, I am saving my queen, but I'm actually setting up something else by going here. And the point is that after the king moves, which is what I was expecting, I have this move, rook takes b7 check. And the point is that after the king takes, I now have bishop to a6 check, and my opponent here resigned because they're about to lose their queen. So how did I see this, right? Like, what, what was going on? Well, Back here, as soon as my opponent took this, it reminded me of a tactic that I've seen in the past. And the tactic that I've seen in the past is there is a piece somewhere along here, a rook or a queen, something that's attacking the queen, except the bishop's in the way. And if you can move the bishop with a check on the king, then it unleashes that piece and you can take the queen for free. So that was like in my mind, but of course I don't have a piece here. Right? I don't have a rook or a queen there, but I was thinking, I wonder if I could do that. I wonder if I could set up that by moving my queen maybe back here or my rook up or something like this, right? So I kept that in the back of my mind as the game went on. So of course I'm gonna take that. And then remember when I said I was kind of setting up that tactic, well, one of the problems with that not working is that both of these moves aren't check, right? They have to be check or it doesn't work. I can't really get rid of the bishop, but I can get rid of the pawn. So I captured it thinking to myself, okay, I'm getting closer now. Like if I brought the rook back and the bishop here with check, that's one way to do it. So I'm kind of thinking about that. And then my opponent played here. And again, I'm thinking, okay, I probably want to move this somewhere. This is super obvious. If I move here like that, my opponent's going to see that right away. So how can I disguise that? How can I find a more complicated version of that? And I was thinking of this move queen to h3 check. But then I said to myself, but then the problem is the king's going to be on a dark square and I can't check with the bishop on the dark square, so it's not going to work, right? But then I thought to myself, but if my rook's on e7 and I sacrifice with a check, that's probably going to force the king to take. And guess what? b7 is a white square that my bishop can attack with check. And if my queen happens to be here on h3, guess what? I can take the queen. So that's what my brain was thinking about. And that's why I played rook to e7. Now, it also happens to be a good move. I'm not just like putting all my eggs in one basket of like, okay, if my opponent, you know, sees this, I'm just done for. No, this is a good solid move, regardless of if this tactic ends up working out. But it's there, and I wanted to try to go for it. And at the same time, this is a great move, right? And sure enough, my opponent captures, and it worked out perfectly for me that it probably looked to my opponent like I was just trying to save 
my queen with a check, when in reality, I'm actually setting up this nasty tactic, right? And so they really needed to play rook to d7 to try to hold on. It's still not a great position for black. I can take the pawn and and this is pinned and it's you know still good for me, but that would have been better. They did play king there and then I did the, the follow up. And like I said, they resigned. So that's what my brain was thinking about. Hopefully that helps you guys a little bit there. But I wanna point out something else. And that's the fact that in this position right here, I had a much better move than queen to h3 check. Now, whenever you see kind of like a winning line, there's not really anything wrong with playing that. So I don't feel bad that I play this, right? But um, it just goes to show that there's so many options in complicated positions like this. And uh, before I say anything else, if you'd like to pause, what do you think the actual best move in the position was? It's not queen to h3. Well, if you had a chance to look at that, the move here is rook takes f6. And... There's, there's so many things about this move that we have to talk about. First of all, why are we giving up our rook for a knight? That's one reason. Second of all, um, or maybe this should be first, why are we giving up our queen, right? So let's start with that one because that one's easy. The point here is that we have a checkmate. That's just our ladder checkmate. There it is. Game over. Um, which, honestly, I didn't even think about in this position because, you know, like right here, this is not checkmate. That could block. And also, I didn't really want to move my rook off the back rank because I was worried about stuff like this. And then the third thing is like, I'm just giving up my rook for the knight. Even if, you know, I would have, let's just say, seen this. What about this? This is another part to the puzzle. Like, why am I giving up the rook for the knight? So if you'd like to pause, what's the, the follow up here for white? Well, if you had a chance to do that, it's the move queen to g3. And it's an amazing little simple move but it's just threatening checkmate and it turns out black can't stop it just can't stop it there's there's no way to defend this unless you're going to go here with your rook but that leads to this followed by this which is checkmate now this is a kind of a tricky checkmate to see so that's one part of it the other part of this is that there's a check here but after king to f2 black has no follow-up there's no good checks for the queen uh, the rook check doesn't really do anything. You just take it. Like, there's just no follow-up moves for black. So, uh, and then, you know, the king can move here. doesn't matter. That's still checkmate. There's just no other moves for uh, for black. There's no way for the queen to, you know, come back and defend this. There's just nothing for, for black to do. So, going back here, and just I want to point this out. If I would have played queen g3 right away, there is this move rook to d7. And black defends. And there's no rook to e8 because the knight is covering it, right? So that's why we had to um, sacrifice this first, then play queen g3 because now this, you know, we already talked about this, is checkmate. Okay, so that was pretty complicated. And I did not see all of that primarily because of this line. Uh, let's see. Primarily because of this move right here. The, the fact that there was no way for black to, uh, you know, stop this checkmate wasn't really on my radar. And so giving up the rook to set that up, it was just, I wasn't even thinking down that line, right? Also, I was focused on this tactic, which was, was a good idea, and it worked out in my favor, and I won the game. So that was another reason. But I just wanted to point out, like, there's all kinds of crazy tactics in chess. And so, anyway, I hope that helps you guys a little bit with the, the thought process. Just to kind of summarize, the key point was, I've seen this tactic before, where there's a piece behind um, my bishop, and I move it to deliver a check and I win a piece, right? I've seen that before. Very simple tactic, nothing complicated about that. And I paired that knowledge with some other features in the position to ultimately set it up and win the queen, okay? So that's that's kind of how you take those little basic tactics, you pair them together and you get more complicated ones. Hope you guys learned something from that. And uh, like, I meant, like I mentioned, the, uh, the opening is in my E4 Gambit course. There's a link in the description if you wanna check that out. All right, see you guys next time. As always, stay sharp, play smart, and take care.